Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Ah. That's really powerful, isn't it? In darkness I dance, in shadows I sing. We've been going through a hard time. It's been going on a long time. And I, I chose this title, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. That's my talk title today. I didn't invent those words. I'll, I'll tell you where they came from in a minute. But I thought, boy, do we ever need an encouraging message about joy? Do we need to be reminded that we have choice around the way we interact, around the way we show up as resilient spiritual men and women? So that's why I'm here today. I want to tell you about that. But first, I have a joke. I've had a little time off, so I've been a little bit more time on the Internet than is probably good for anybody. And I think it was somebody from this church who posted this, but I can't remember who, so forgive me for not giving credit, but... I probably should look at it just to make sure you get the wording right. But did you know, if we're all trying to be healthier and more conscious about what we put in our bodies, that by replacing potato chips with grapefruit as a snack, you can lose up to 90% of what little joy you have left in your life? Did you know that? Yeah. I told a similar one a couple of weeks ago. There's something really funny about that. Well, so I'm going to start by just uh, distinguishing joy and happiness. Um, joy is a spiritual quality. That, that song that I sang in our meditation today, I talked about those seven qualities of life or of God that Thomas Troward, who was a, a, one of the early writers in the New Thought movement, he talked about life, love, light, power, peace, beauty, and joy. These are eternal qualities of the divine, and they have no opposite. This is oneness, what we're speaking of, unity, that we are one with this infinite life, this infinite field of consciousness, and this infinite um, awareness of life itself. This is the truth of us. Joy is who and what we are. Joy is what the universe is. It is unassailable. It is inviolable. It, it cannot ever go away. It is as solid, well, more solid than anything that has, has um, a material presence. We, we tend to think in terms of a binary, of a duality, but I'm going to invite us to think of it in terms more of polarity, that we learn uh, the truth of the spiritual reality by experiencing an apparent opposite sometimes. And so the apparent opposite of joy might indeed be sorrow, heartbreak, but it is not actually the opposite of joy because it has none. Happiness is conditional. I get really happy when things go the way I think they ought to go. When you act the way I think you ought to act, I can be really happy about that. And you can see what trouble that would set me up for, right? Because I'm, I'm sharing this planet right now with 7 billion other people choosing freely. And some of them are not choosing as I think they ought. And so my happiness is limited because it's conditional. But joy is not based upon condition. It is native to who and what we are. It's eternal, and it's always available. Now, I was thinking about this, too. How would I define joy? And these, I'm going to say, these seven essential qualities that Thomas Troward wrote about, I'm going to talk about them more in a moment. Um, I don't believe that that's the exhaustive list, but it's a good place to start. Each one of these, life, light, love, power, peace, beauty, and joy, the more you begin to feel into it, words begin to fail. It's really hard to actually say what it is, but it is something you do know when you experience it. And for me, joy feels, there are two words that have been resonating with me all week long. It's connective and it's expansive. When I'm connected to my own life, when I'm connected to the people that I love, I was thinking about the high moments of joy for many people, the birth of their children. That's a moment of high joy and connection. 
And something expansive, like more than just little old me, even though I'm not much, that's all I think about, something bigger. So we experience those moments of joy when we're listening to a symphony, when we're standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon, something larger than us. We forget about our little problems. We're part of something big. This is how I think of joy that we are connected to something far greater than our current experience. The phrase, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I had a funny experience with this a couple of years ago. We do a white stone ceremony um, early in the year, each year, and it's based upon a Bible verse from the book of Revelation where um, they were given a new name written upon a white stone. And so we do a meditation, and then we open our intuitive minds to, to see if we can discern or divine a word that will help guide us through this coming year. And a couple of years ago, I was kind of new to this job. I'd been here a while, but I'm new to the senior minister job, and I thought, I'm going to need strength or perseverance, or I'm going to need something. I need something kind of gutsy, right? And the word kept coming, joy. <laughs> no, no, I don't need joy. I need, I need, like, power. I need something really kind of manly and tough. And joy. <laughs> and so finally, I wrote it down. And the moment I wrote down the word joy, I remembered this scripture. The joy of the Lord is my what? Strength. My strength. Isn't that beautiful? And it was like, Yeah. Strength doesn't have to be arduous and like, I mean, how many of you think about strength being, you know, pushing the weights and you know, it's so, uh, a lot of testosterone in strength. But no, spiritually, strength comes from joy. This passage, the, 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 the joy of the Lord is my strength, it actually um, comes from a passage in the um, Hebrew Bible shortly after the, um, the exile in Babylon, the, the children of Israel had been driven out of Israel. The temple had been destroyed. And they had been living in Babylon. And there's, in Psalm 137, this is a song, a song of lamentation. This came before the, the Nehemiah passage I'm going to read. By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Can you feel the pain of the people in exile being demanded to sing the song of joy and say, how can we sing a joy when we're separate from all that is precious to us, the place where we connect to the Most High? So in the history of this, this people, um, often beset and besieged by more powerful nations around, they, they eventually overthrew the exile. They came back to Jerusalem, and under the leadership of the governor Nehemiah and the prophet Ezra, they began to restore and rebuild and after the walls of Jerusalem had been rebuilt, Ezra and Nehemiah called all the people together. And they began to celebrate. They said, the time of grief and weeping is over. Now is the time for joy. In the chapter 8 of the book of Nehemiah, verse 10 Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food, grapefruit or potato chips, and sweet drinks, <laughs> and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Most High. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The metaphysics of this story are pretty clear. We go through things that exile us from the, the presence and the power of the one life. In our thought, we are separate from the joy, from the peace, from the power, from the love of God. We, we feel alone and isolated, small, besieged, beset, and cast out. Or is that just me? Anybody else? Anyone ever relate? You know? Okay, I see some hands going way up. Yeah, we've had... Have we not had a chance to experience those conditions in this last year and a half? 
with the political upheaval, the pandemic that we hoped was going away, and now here we are again with this, oh my goodness. If we were dependent upon the conditions in the external world to be where we need to be to find the, the, the power, the joy, the love, we would be up a creek. And that creek has a name in the vernacular of some people I know. I'm not going to say that name. <laughs> up a certain creek without a paddle. But no. We do not have to remain in exile. We are invited back into the holy city. The holy city of communion of the one life where we breathe in and out in the same breath of possibility and good. In dualistic religious traditions, God is separate. And God interacts with uh, those of us who are not a part of that heavenly realm, but it's unclear exactly how that interaction happens. In philosophy, it's called the hard problem of philosophy. How does the, the pure spiritual world interact with this mundane, lowly, fallen world? Well, we don't even have to answer that question because in unity we teach that God has never been absent anywhere, anytime. That the presence and power is here and here and here. If we only can remember. If we only can remember and to, to put back together our consciousness with the truth of spiritual reality. That God hasn't gone anywhere. It is I who have exiled myself by my thoughts of lack and separation. By my unwillingness to be in that space of surrender. You see, we are not meant to surrender like I give up when it gets too hard. I surrender and I give over the control of my life to the infinite intelligence which uses me as his instrument. This is the invitation. And everything that happens in your life is an invitation to oneness. Including COVID. It's an invitation to remember True power, true strength already within you. So we're going to do a little, little affirmation here, a little responsive recitation. Those seven qualities from Thomas Choward. What I'm, going to, I'm going to say the first one. God is blank, and then you say, I am. That same word. You ready? God is light. I am light. God is life. God is love. God is power. God is peace. God is beauty. I am beauty. Some of you lit up on that one. God is joy. I am joy. Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. To affirm this truth. To come out of ex exile of our own divided mind and be reunited with the truth of God's power and presence right where we are. This is the invitation. Now I'm not saying that we don't grieve because we do. The Buddhists remind us, as we, we get, did a talk on Buddhism and Hinduism a couple of weeks ago, and they remind us that we lose everything. Everything. Everything that has, is in form is temporary. It's all going away. All the relationships, all of the homes, all of the jobs, all, everything is going away because it's not meant to be here eternally. For, forever, spirit is pouring itself in and out of form. The being, the pure, undifferentiated oneness, the pure potentiality of God must always give itself into form. And while that form is here, we interact. We, we experience divine qualities in those relationships, in these homes, in these beautiful sanctuaries like this. But we don't become attached to the stuff. But when it goes, what do we feel? We feel the loss. So we do hang our harps upon the poplars. We do sing our songs of lamentations. We give ourselves space to grieve. And that time is over at some point. This is, I love the Jewish tradition because they have very, you know, it's very, a lot of laws in Judaism, right? But it really addresses the living needs of human beings. And if you lose an immediate family member, you're given a year to grieve year where you're, you, don't have to, you don't have to go to any dances or social calls. You don't have to go to any nightclubs or movies. If you don't want to, you say, no, I'm grieving. And then at the end of that year, 
it is complete. That the time of grief is over. Remember, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The metaphysics of the Nehemiah story also reminds us that to rebuild the walls of the holy city, what does it take? What does it take to build a wall? It takes materials and labor. For me, the way I metaphysically interpreted this part of the story is it's your practice. You can't just move from exile in Babylon to the holy city of Jerusalem, go from grief to joy without some work on your part. And I'm so grateful that we, we teach the practice. The practice is the way that we take this very kind of elusive truth idea that God is love. Well, then how does that show up in my life? What do I do to, to put that in my body, to put that in my mind on a regular basis? Our main practices, prayer and meditation, but not just those. We can be mindful without meditating. I was mindful when I was driving this morning because I knew I was going to talk about it and I had to be able to say that I was doing it, so I did it. <laughs> I journal. I write. That is a spiritual practice. Spiritual reading is a spiritual practice. And gratitude is a practice. This is the way we rebuild the walls of the holy city within us. I was listening to a wonderful podcast by Brene Brown, and if you don't like cussing, don't listen to it, um, but it's wonderful. She and her sisters um, do a, it's a six-week uh, kind of walk through her book of 10 years ago, the books of, book of uh, Gifts of Imperfection, which I have taught from many times here on Sunday morning, but she talks about joy, and you know, she's a researcher right here at University of Houston, one of our own, and she has done a lot of research into wholehearted living. That's what her work is about. She's a shame researcher, the thing that keeps us from living wholeheartedly. And the research has shown that there is a distinct connection between people who are joyful and people who are grateful. And she said that she assumed that the, that made sense to her because if you are experiencing joy, of course you'd be grateful. And there is a causality here, but it goes in the other direction. The people who practice gratitude experience more joy. Do I need to say that again? The people who practice gratitude experience more joy. She was talking about the gratitude practice she had with her kids, with her family at the dinner table, but during COVID, she said, it just felt like one more thing to do. My kids were already struggling. We let it go. She, said, now I, she says, now I know I made a mistake, that that would have actually been the remedy, not just another thing to do, the remedy. So I'm inviting you to, if you don't have a gratitude practice, here's the way I was taught to do it. Five things in the morning. Write them down that you're grateful for. Try not to repeat. Find new things. Find things that are active and alive in you today. I'm grateful for this thing today. That's all you have to do. Just start. Begin to be aware of your blessings, of the way that God's abundance and supply are already in your life. And all you have to do is name it. There's a spiritual law that says that to which you pay attention expands in your experience. I used to write songs about it. You got to accentuate the positive. Remember that one? I'm not going to sing it now. <laughs> the truth is you are a divine being having a human experience. This is the truth of you. And as you're having these human experiences, the temptation is always to go back to exile in Babylon. Well, it's over now. This is the thing I can't get over. Every one of you here and every one of you out there has a 100% success rate of getting through the challenges of your life or else you wouldn't be here today. All of us. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. We've made it. We've made it. To this day, we're here. Now send a little gratitude to that former you that got you here. Can you feel that? The one that went to those stupid AA meetings. The one who paid back those debts. The one who did whatever, got, did the, all those treatments to get you through the medical crisis. Grateful for that former you that brought you here today. And now your future you is asking for the same assistance. Don't give up. Stay active. See what's needed from you today. Stay with it. And you will get through this, whatever this is. I'm going to close today with a little reading, a couple of readings from the Gospel of John. I, um, 
You know, I am grateful that I grew up with a lot of Bible. There were many years that was not on my list. I'll just say that after I had sort of deconstructed my evangelical faith I grew up with. I, there were many years I wanted a lot of distance between me and anything the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. No, I just didn't want much to do with it. But now I'm grateful for it because it's in me. And now I can come back to it with this beautiful metaphysical lens that we practice here in unity. It's different. It's not to condemn or judge me. It's to open me to possibilities, to spiritual possibilities and principles and power. Well, the other, besides the joy of the Lord is my strength verse, the other one that kept coming to me all week long was that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. That's the King James. And I was thinking, I think that's probably Paul somewhere, but no, it's in the Gospel of John. This, at the end of Jesus' ministry, he had gathered disciples there before the passion, before the crucifixion. He gave them some, well, according to this narrative, which is not recorded in the other three the Synoptic Gospels. So Father Richard Rohr, a wonderful Catholic priest, he wrote a new book called The Universal Christ. And he says that when we read the Gospel of John, we can't be thinking of it as Jesus, the man from Nazareth, telling you something. This is the universal mind. This is the Christ mind speaking to you. This is that same mind that was in all of the enlightened leaders and teachers of all traditions. This mind is speaking and so this is what Jesus says in the 15th chapter where the Christ speaks to us. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in love. And I have told you this so that your joy may be in you, my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment? Do you remember Jesus' answer? Well, he actually turned it back on him and said, what is that? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the commandment. And if we remain in love, the givingness of spiritual energy, if we remain in that, then our joy, will be complete. The word here in Greek is pleru, and I'm sure I mispronounced it, but it means to make complete, to fully realize. This is what we do with our affirmation. We take the unformed potentiality of God and we make it real. We realize it. That we are here to realize the love of God. In the next chapter, this is John 16, that's the same one. Here it is. So with you. Now is your time of grief. But I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Your joy will be fully realized to ask in the name and the nature of the Christ, in, in that connection, that infinite, eternal connection with God. That's who and what we are. Jesus was not the great exception. He was the great example. He was here to show us the way, that it, mean, the way it is to live in Christ consciousness. And we are called to that. So I don't know who it is among you that needed this word of encouragement here today, but I'm hoping you're listening. Oh, it may be me. <laughs> to remind us all that we are not limited by what's going on in the world of conditions. We are not limited by what is going on in the world of conditions. You've all day always heard that, certain, that thing, well, I'm doing pretty good under the circumstances. Well, what are you doing under there? That's not where you're called to live. You're called to live in the truth of God's love and power. So I invite you now to join me in prayer. Yeah, just breathe. With each breath, we draw into our physical body 
millions of molecules. Nitrogen, mostly. Oxygen, argon, a lot of other things that might be out there. It's said that even though the argon molecules are they're inert, the same number of them has always been here in the atmosphere of this planet. And so the, with that breath you just took in was the, that same, at least one of those argon atoms was also in the body of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, was also in the body of, of Buddha, of Muhammad. That we are a part of some infinite revelation of God's being, God's power and possibility through humanity. We're a part of that. And we're called to that. So right here, right here in this moment, I remember this truth. There is only one life, one power, one presence, and it is what I am. It is what each of us is. That we are all one with this power. And in this unity, I speak my word that we are stepping forward into the truth of our being in new and undreamed of ways. We are stepping beyond our fear. We're releasing our old, limited beliefs, and we are moving into the realm of possibility. Our dreams and the, the power to create them united in this breath. And we are willing to do what is needed to practice, to build our consciousness, so that we can contain this new city, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth that is being birthed in us now. We say yes, we are available. Use us, God. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Through me, through us all. We give thanks that this is so. We let it be, and so it is. Amen. Thank you. And if no one has told you to, that they love you today, Karen was right. I do love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.